and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard the Financial Independence Podcast. G'day, and welcome to another episode of Captain Fire, the Financial Independence Podcast, where I open the cockpit to some of the best and brightest in personal finance, as well as those who have reached or are on their way to financial independence. Before we get started, remember, nothing said here is financial advice, and you should always do your own independent research before making any financial choices. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the episode and learn something new. This podcast is brought to you by the best portfolio tracking tool for Aussie investors. ShareSite makes it incredibly simple to track your portfolio with automatic updates of share purchases and dividends, easy to read graphs, and comprehensive tax and performance reporting, all wrapped up in an easy to use cloud-based system. For users with fewer than 10 holdings, it is completely free, and I even used the free version for years. Head over to captainfire.com forward slash ShareSite dash review to see if ShareSite is for you. Captain Fire listeners can score themselves four months of ShareSite Premium for free by using the bonus signup code in the article. If you do ever decide to hold more than 10 stocks, be sure to use this code to get your first four months for free. Even if you do only plan to use the free version, using the code means if you ever do upgrade, you'll still get your four months for free. Ditch the Excel spreadsheet and complete your tax with a click of a button by signing up today. That's captainfire.com forward slash ShareSite dash review for your four free months. On board today is Anna Christina, who works in fintech under product management, but is also obsessed with personal finance and runs her own blog under the same name, which is all about personal finance and career advancement. Anna, how are you going? I'm doing great. How are you today? Yeah, good, thanks. Obviously, we've chatted quite a bit together offline, but for people on the blog who you are new to, would you be able to introduce yourself and maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from? Yeah, perfect. So my name is Anna. I have a blog under my name, AnnaChristina.com. I write a bit about career, personal finance, and any passion I have around travel and so forth, around how you can better yourself. And I work in fintech. I work in product management, which is really focused about creating better products for the users, which I feel quite passionate about. And so I blend all of that together in terms of what I share on the internet. Yeah, it's awesome. I like some of your stuff about travel and obviously people that are listening might be able to pick up a slight accent. So where is that accent from? I'm Canadian. My family is from Croatia, so I also speak Croatian, but I was born and raised in Canada and moved over to Australia about eight years ago. Oh my God. So trilingual, you speak Croatian, Canadian, and Australian. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know if it quite works that way. So I guess you touched a bit about what Money with Anna is about, but how can you help people on their journey to financial independence? Yeah. So what I love to do is just document my own learnings and my own journey. So I'm in my late thirties. I wish I came across financial independence and some of these personal finance ideas earlier in my life as we all do. But being where I am now, I feel that a lot of people are in a similar part of their own journey. I do have a young family. I'm figuring out how to move forward in my own career. And I'm just trying to document that and help others along the way. And so I started doing that by blogging when I went on parental leave with my first child and I got positive feedback from people asking a lot of questions around how did I start investing? What are the things I've considered and my own personal finance journey? And so I thought if I can continue sharing that as I learn, potentially I can help other people as well. So of course, none of what I share is personal finance advice. I'm not a financial advisor by any means, but I do know that sharing a journey of what you're learning along the way can help others because it really did help me when I came across financial independence. I think it's brilliant. And I actually started blogging pretty much doing the same thing. Exactly. Not trying to reinvent the wheel, but just showing people that oh, it is possible and it really helps me stay accountable as well. So what has your journey to FIRE looked like so far? 
Yeah, it's been an interesting one. So I came from a frugal background. My parents were immigrants. A lot of my frugality and my relationship with money really came from my father who talked quite a bit about, it's not how much money you make, it's how much you save. And that has always stuck with me. But the problem for me was that there was no added part to that where it's about investing or what you should actually take those savings and put it in. So for a very long time, I just had savings in a bank account. And of course, I had personal goals. I wanted to travel and I wanted to do these things. But it only happened when I moved to Australia, actually, where I had more disposable income because I got a job with a higher wage and I didn't know what to do with my savings. So my bank account was getting bigger, but I really wanted to figure out how do I make money off my money? What do I do? A lot of people in Australia and in Canada invest in property. And that was just something that I wasn't ready to do as a non-resident of Australia. And so I went down this big journey of learning about what I should invest in. And it started out by talking to financial advisors who back in Canada will charge you 2.5%, the highest in the world on your investments. And I realized that, hey, actually, there's a lot of information on the internet that I can teach myself and came across Mr. Money Mustache and realized that actually there are other people who are sharing their journey and I can educate myself and make these decisions, which was quite empowering for me. And so I'm quite late to the fire journey. I came across it in my 30s and it's evolved over the years as well. But what I did learn was that reading other blogs, listening to podcasts, hearing how other people have evolved from reducing their expenses to increasing their income, that I could also do that as well. And so financial independence isn't unachievable. It is actually something that I can do. And so this is where I am in my journey. It's exciting. I love that. I love that there's just so much information that you can get online and I love how inspiring it is. And so like you, I love going and reading other people's blogs and looking at their journey to FI and how far they're getting along. Yeah, it's just really cool. It's become like a little hobby passion of mine. And so I know on your blog, career is obviously a huge um, focus and you you talked a lot about it. Specifically, you've talked about remote working uh, and your time as a travel writer, Mm -hmm. but would you be able to tell the audience uh, a little bit more about that aspect of the blog? So my career is a huge focus for me because it has really allowed me to have the lifestyle that I want. When I started out, when I graduated university, I graduated with a BFA. So that means Bachelor of Fine Arts. And really, there's two avenues that you can do with that. Either you can be an artist or you can be an art teacher. And even though I dabbled in the arts quite a bit, as my career evolved, I realized that there were other more lucrative and better paying jobs that I could do. And the pivotal point for me was when I moved to Australia and I got a job in tech and I realized you don't actually need to be an engineer or a technical person to work in tech. There's a lot of roles that you can do within that space. And I evolved from a comms marketing position to a user researcher position, which ended up with me being in product management, which is where I am today. And what that means for people who don't know, product management really focuses on the products that get built on a platform that also helps the business grow, but also is user-centric and helps the user or the customer in a way of solving their problems. So I really love my job because I work very closely with engineers and so forth, but I didn't know that this was an avenue or a possibility. And in learning that there are other jobs out there that you don't have to have that technical background of engineering, that you can move into tech, I realized that also I can increase my income and my savings rate along the way. And so sharing some of that, I wish I knew this when I was younger, is also part of my FIRE journey. Because when I left Canada, I was on a quite low income in comparison, and I have more than doubled my income coming to Australia when I first moved over. And had I had someone be like, hey, listen, just because you studied in the arts doesn't mean you have to stay there. Yes, you can evolve and you can learn new skills, and tech is really a space to be. That's something that I really want to share within my own career development, because often you can feel pigeonholed in a career that is really hard to move from. And that also then creates this belief that you can't increase your income as well, which isn't true. And so these are little things that I had to teach myself along the way that is also a part of that psychology around FIRE, where yes, you can reduce your expenses as much as possible, but the other side of increasing your income is is infinite. And that's just something that I love to share and talk about. 
It's not something that really gets talked a lot about in this whole personal finance community. A lot of it's like, hey, I didn't have my morning latte, so I've got another $2 worth of ETFs or something. Whereas, yeah, if you're going to focus on your maximum return activities, the career is a huge one. So it sounds like you really love your job. I guess a lot of people, the reason they're into fire is they probably feel like they don't have enough control over their life. They want to regain some financial independence and a bit more control over their life. But it sounds like you're absolutely killing it. I'm guessing you get to work from home with tech if it's a progressive platform. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I do love my job and I love what I'm doing because what I'm doing on an everyday basis is I'm solving problems for users. I'm solving problems for the business and I'm trying to bring those two together in a very viable, feasible, valuable way. Yes, working from home has been a godsend. I think originally I was living quite close to the city and I'd walk to the city all the time and you could see people and it was great working in an office. Obviously the pandemic hit and working from home opened the doors for me because I also became a parent around the same time. And so my values changed, right? Walking to work, seeing people is quite different in terms of now where I want to make sure that I'm there for my kid and I can pick my kid up from childcare and spend some time together. So I think working from home has become such a blessing, especially in this time in my life where I am a parent. And yeah, it's made my life easier. I never ever want to go to the office again. I do miss the interactions with people, but I don't want to work from an office again ever. That is exactly (laughs) how I feel. Like I did spend time working in operations and look, it was nice having people, but there were long shifts. They were really stressful. I lost of just being at home and I'm really enjoying personally for me just like tinkering on websites and having passion projects like this podcast so I guess just on that if you hit your fire number are you still going to work if you really enjoy work is there any reason to stop yeah that's a great question my partner and I talk about this all the time we're quite aligned when it comes to our financial goals and I don't think either of us will stop working we might pare back a bit or work more on passion projects but we both do love our jobs and what we're doing We both work in tech and it's just an exciting space. There's always something going on. But there are always side projects that you want to do on the side that we both do, right? I do this blog and I write and I create content. And I know my partner creates video games and board games and random things that we don't have the time to pursue because we do have to work. So it's just a matter of balancing those. And I think to your point, like it is really interesting. A lot of people in FIRE do talk about having these different avenues of passive income, which are really important, right? Whatever it might be, your side hustle, your blog, your property income, and so forth. But also because we spend so much time day in, day out at work, I think focusing on happiness at work and increasing that income is just so paramount in that fire space. So I love that more people are talking about the growth in their own careers and how to negotiate and how to continue on from there. So I guess the answer to your question is I'll probably still work, just in what capacity that might change. Yeah. So shifting it and allowing you the flexibility to pursue your interests like passion projects and stuff. I think it's a great idea. And I think really you've got to do something. You can't just sit on the couch all day. I think Dave from Strong Money Australia, he said something that I really liked and it was, you're not retiring from something, you're retiring to something. And so you've got to think about what are you actually going to do? You can't just quit your job and sit around doing nothing. You want to have fun and work on passion projects. So look, Anna, unpacking a little bit more about career development, what are some things people can do to earn more? Like where can you go to learn about how do I upskill? How can I know that I'm getting paid a fair rate? How can I negotiate better? What are some of the tools and some of the tips and tricks you've found to increase your income from your career? That's a great question. I think the number one thing is to do research. There's websites such as Glassdoor and so forth where you can actually see different wages in your industry. I know LinkedIn also has an area where you can look that up. And so people do include their salary, including any type of bonuses. So often if you work in tech, you might have options or stocks that are associated with your wage, with your salary that you get, your salary package. And so being able to look at all of that and weigh the pros and cons of that equity and your salary and understanding what you're worth in your industry. That's number one. Number one is understanding what your worth is. I guess number two, I think for me is talking to other people about your 
salary. It's quite taboo to talk about how much you make, but especially if you're in the same industry and you're working with someone else who's doing a similar job to you, the only person who's benefiting from not sharing your salary is actually the company, right? They're the ones who hold that privilege of knowing how much people are paid and can underpay other people. And so having that transparency by talking to other people and sharing what your salary is, that's really helpful so that you can understand where you're at. Are you getting paid less than other people? And there are many times in my career where I found out I was. And by knowing that, it allowed me to be able to negotiate, which brings me to my third point would be going and negotiating. And there's a couple different ways to do this. The easiest way to jump in your career and negotiate is by going to another company. It's harder to be able to negotiate your way up if you're already in a company, I found from experience and from talking to other people. But if you go to another company, it is much easier to negotiate everything right off the get-go, everything from your salary to your equity to holiday to so forth. And you have that in writing and it's a fresh place to start. So being armed by knowing your worth and doing that research up front, it's easier to then go and negotiate. If you're in a role that you love and you still want to stay at that company, which I've also done, being able to negotiate based on your performance results. So being able to say, hey, listen, I've achieved this. I've increased this by X percent. I've delivered this and this has impacted the company in X, Y, Z type of ways is really important. What I used to always do is have a document on the side that I would open up and include all of these things. So every time we released a new product and there was a positive impact on that, I would write it down so that I wouldn't forget because in six months time when you're looking for a job or when your review comes up, you may forget that information. So by writing it down, you have it documented. You can then also include it in your resume in the future. And also when you have a down bad day, it's nice to look at this document and look at your achievements. But by having this arsenal of information that you've captured in terms of how you've benefited the company, it is easier than to go into negotiations and talk to your employer and say, hey, look at all of the things I've done. This is my expected increase in salary. And so those are just a couple different ways that you can try to negotiate a better wage for yourself. And sometimes if the monetary side is not as important, there are ways to maybe potentially negotiate the equity side or holidays or being able to get more paid vacation or whatever that might be. So there are areas that you can negotiate or even a title change. Having a title change is quite important. The other thing to keep kind of in the back of your pocket is going to other interviews. So even if you're not looking for a job, even if you're not interested in jumping ship, just constantly talking to recruiters and seeing what's out there will allow you to have a better understanding of your own worth, of what your wage could be, your salary could be elsewhere, and also just keeping those skills fresh. Interviewing is a skill set in itself. The more you do it, the less nervous you'll become, the easier it is to go somewhere and actually negotiate your worth. So those are some of the tips that I would suggest when it comes to salary negotiation, because it is a huge part of our life working and you want to be paid what you're worth. Absolutely. And for pretty much all of us, that is the biggest source of income. So a lot of people focus on uh, side hustling here, getting a little bit of income here and selling things on marketplace, that kind of stuff. While that has its place, the prime focus should obviously be on that maximum return activity, which is your your wage. And it makes that's a gold mine. That's brilliant. Now, as someone who's shifted roles and jobs and worked for many different companies, sometimes I've had three or four jobs at once. I wish I knew that when I was 17 and starting <laughs> starting my journey. From an aviation specific side, there's a website called AFAP, which is I think the Federation or the Guild of Air Pilots. And they have a link to the award. So you can actually see what aircraft you're flying, or a single twin engine, scenic flights, a regular passenger transport, that kind of stuff, what the actual minimum award wage is. So I found that really helpful to know when I went in to try and negotiate, for example, about my pay as a flying instructor. But I found it very difficult because I didn't really have many people to talk to about what was an appropriate amount of money to earn. And I guess more recently now running a bunch of different websites, I feel like I'm entering this new area now 
and I still don't really know what are reasonable rates for advertising and things like that on my aviation site and like my gardening site. So reaching out and talking to people in the niche in the industry has been super helpful. So it sounds like you've got an absolute gold mine of experience when it comes to career advancement. So I think I'm going to be paying a bit more attention to some of your articles on career advancement. So hopefully you can write some about, about the marketing space. That'll benefit me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll talk to some experts. Do you have a side hustle? My side hustle is websites, a form of digital real estate. If you want to learn more about this lucrative side hustle, check out my review of the eBusiness Institute and their online self-paced courses. They cover everything from total beginners right through to advanced web design and how to buy, renovate, and sell websites for profit. As a graduate of Matt and Liz's courses, I can't thank them enough for the valuable web skills they gave me, and now I enjoy growing my portfolio of websites for income. Captain Fire listeners can register for free access to some of these courses by signing up using the link at www.captainfire.com forward slash ebusiness dash institute dash review. Build your portfolio of digital real estate and start using websites to make money today. Look, say Anna, you touched on earlier how work from home made your life a lot more easier balancing a young family and being a mum. We often see women, particularly mothers, disadvantaged financially, whether that comes to how much you're being paid, career negotiations, household labor, those kind of things. How has starting a family and being a mum impacted your career and your family's journey to financial independence? This is such a topic that is very dear to my heart. A huge part, I think, is just realizing how expensive it is having a child. Not only are children expensive because you need to buy all the things, but now there's a loss of income. If you're a single household, then absolutely that is super detrimental. If you have two incomes, it is still quite challenging. But there are other things that compound over time, such as super, right? You're no longer having your employer pay into your super. The cost of childcare is also quite high. And all these things compound over time. And at the end of the day, a lot of women are disadvantaged by this. And so from my own experience, there was a lot of things that I considered prior to having kids. And I had my first kid at 35, no spring chicken. But what I tried to do is save up as much as possible in order to go through this life change. I was quite fortunate because often tech companies are a little bit more progressive when it comes to some of their policy around parental leave. And they did pay for my super during my whole leave, which was a year, which I was quite grateful for. But had they not, I would have a loss of compounding within my super. Similarly, because I do have a higher income than my partner, we had to adjust in terms of our expenses and how we were going to shuffle that around. And so women often are disadvantaged within this space. And also by taking a break in their career, they have a big gap in their resume. And so going back to the workforce is a little bit harder and challenging in terms of finding a job. Many cases, women are the ones who stay at home and want to raise kids or work part-time. And so part-time work is also not as available and is sometimes a challenge in higher paid roles. And all of these, again, compound. Luckily for me, I have a very supportive partner who we're very aligned with when it comes to child caring duties and finances and so forth. But over time, the compounding effect of child care costs, loss of income, loss of super really disadvantages women. And if you're not financially literate, if you don't have exposure to thinking about this stuff as a woman, often if divorce happens down the line, there's also a huge disadvantage that happens because in many cases, not always, women are the ones who often care after their children in a divorce kind of situation. And if they're disadvantaged financially, this compounds. So I think it's so important for financial literacy to be taught, especially to young women, especially to moms, and how that actually impacts the family. It's really powerful stuff. Like I am so grateful for my mom and her financial literacy. She self-professes that, you know, that she's no expert, but she was able to keep our household running on you know a 0.4 teacher salary with three kids at home and no child support so we've seen that firsthand unfortunately in that kind of financial abuse that can happen with separations so I'm totally on board I think financial literacy is super important especially for women and I think we need to have this conversation about how can we make this system fairer and more equitable so for blokes listening to this it is really important and you need to be on the same page with your partner when it comes to finances. 
Exactly. And I think lobbying the government to also cover things such as super while on leave, it would be really beneficial. There are things like that, that we can do creating policy so that the secondary care, or in a lot of cases, the male care can also take leave is really impactful as well. If we have more fathers, for example, taking leave to care for their kids, you create more space and workspace for people to be able to get promoted, especially women. And it becomes a more equal playing field for people to stay home. Now, I know that not everyone has both parents at home. There's a lot of single parents that have to navigate this. But just creating that shift is so important in rethinking the way we actually think about parental leave. I would love to see some of those policy changes happen sometime in the future. You're definitely a lot smarter than me when it comes to this. You've got firsthand experience. I think the government should be listening to people like you. Well, you know, I, I do go for my Australian citizenship test this week. So fingers crossed I can have more of an impact with a vote in the future. Now, that's funny. So originally from Canada and obviously no stranger to travel with being a travel writer initially. And I guess a fancy term for travel in the whole fire sphere is geographic arbitrage, Mm -hmm. where we talk about moving to lower cost of living areas. I'm pretty fortunate. I've moved from a pretty high cost of living area in Sydney to Adelaide, which is a relatively lower cost of living area. But obviously there are plenty of other reasons to move and travel. So what were some of the reasons that you moved to Australia and how have you found the experience both personally, but also financially? Oh, this is such a great question. I think when I first came across fire, I was also single and geo arbitrage was a huge part of my fire journey. I probably would have hit fire by now had I not had a partner and kid. I have another one on the way. So for me, my goal was to live in a really low cost area and to potentially build out a side hustle. My career has evolved and I am now working remotely, which means it would be quite easy for me to live anywhere that's quite cheaper. Unfortunately, I live in Melbourne. It's quite expensive. I came from a very high cost living area in in Vancouver where housing is quite unaffordable. I would say it's a huge issue for why people are actually leaving Vancouver. The income is really low in Vancouver, but the housing prices and the cost of living is really high. And so when I came to Melbourne, I was actually surprised with the higher income here that you can make. And so the cost of living was quite similar but I was making more money. And so that gap between the expenses and and income was quite big for me. I didn't know if I was going to stay in Melbourne, but I did. I'm here and it is quite expensive. It might not be as expensive as Sydney, but I think it's on par now. But The values in terms of what I needed in my life have changed, right? I now have a family. I have a partner. We're both working. We want space. We want a backyard. And those were things that I didn't need early in my 30s where I was happy to live in a small apartment, walk everywhere, didn't need a car. I was planning on living in a remote country somewhere for a while because it was really cheap. And that's just not the case right now. So we had to bite the bullet. We bought a house. We are now in debt for a very long time, trying to pay it off quite aggressively. And so my fire goals have changed as well. But there was a time where I did travel for about a year. I lived off my savings and lived very cheaply because I was traveling to cheap countries. Again, this comes from a place of privilege. So I recognize this isn't the case for everyone, but I did a lot of couch surfing and hitchhiking and those things are both free. And so I was able to travel the world and experience all of these things in a very cheap way. Whereas if you travel in Australia, it's quite expensive, but if you find a cheap country, you can live there for months on end. Whereas in Australia, a weekend would be the equivalent of that cost. So I did a lot of that cheaper stuff when I was younger and it was a part of my fire goal. But of course that's evolved as I've decided to have a family and my fire number has also increased over time. And that's just life. You just change and adjust as it happens. Of course, the world goes on and we need to remain agile to adjust our plan as we go along. I think ultimately A big takeaway for me about like fire in general and your blog specifically was that ultimately our careers are a way to make money and money is a tool that we can use to improve our lives. So with that being said, what are some of your best tips on how we can maximize our enjoyment and happiness in life and balance this with our fire goals? 
I think it really comes down to your why, like, why are you doing this? What is it that you want? And for me, it's about spending more time with my family, working on some passion projects and just being happy, like knowing what are the things that make me happy. And now with more money, I can create more time with my family. I can potentially take some time off to work on those passion projects. And the thing is money is the means to get somewhere. It's not about wanting to be rich and having all the glorious things that you can purchase. It's really about knowing what your why is and why you're doing this. And because life is really a journey, it's also about the journey of getting there, right? I don't think of fire as an end date or an an end moment where I quit my job and I retire and I have margaritas and I don't do any work and that's it. For me, (laughs) I'm sure you know this, right? You're still working, you're retired, right? And for me, it's exactly the same thing. It's what is my why? And if my why is my passion projects, I'm going to try to make time for them when I can. If my why is my kid and the kid that's coming on the way and my partner, I'm going to try to maximize that time with them. I'm going to do the things that I love with them. And, um, Money just buys me time, right? Like we get paid for our time. We go to work. We get money for the time that we are there for the most part, right? It's not really about what you do. It's about the time that you spend at work. And so in a way, you're just substituting one for the other. By having more money, I will have more time to do the things that I want to. But really, it just it gets hinged on the why part of that. Like, why are you doing this? And for me, it's family, passion projects, being able to travel to see family, because obviously I have family in Canada and Croatia. And those are really my whys. Besides that, I don't really need anything else. <laughs> or at least I wouldn't if I was retired tired. Just working on it. (laughs) It's brilliant. I think understanding your why is super important. There's a brilliant book I read by an author, Simon Sinek. He actually has a book. It's literally called Start With Why. And it's brilliant because it speaks to the psychology of the human condition about if you're trying to lead someone, like when you consider leadership is basically you're, you know, influencing people to do the right thing or in a company to make the company money. You need to be able to inspire them and starting with why and then considering the how and finishing with the what I think is I think those are the three steps he talks about, but starting with the why is super powerful. And we were talking about this in that previous podcast episode about in investor psychology and behavior. And there's a lot of opportunity to stuff up your journey to fire. There's so many opportunities where you can freak out, listen to the media, sell all of your stocks and just make silly financial choices or buy expensive cars, things that you don't need. But if you have a really firm grasp on your why, I think that really helps you to maintain your self-discipline and stick to the goal throughout times when it can be a little bit scary or it can be tempting to deviate from the path. So yeah, massive points to be awarded from knowing your why of fire. So speaking of some side hustles, one that I was actually really interested to bring up, we were chatting a while ago and you mentioned you'd worked for a fintech called Redbubble, which if anyone hasn't seen Redbubble, it's basically like a global sort of artwork slash print on demand service. You can create designs and upload them. And I've made some money like side hustling using Redbubble to make t-shirts like funny slogans and stuff but I'd be really interested to hear from your side what was it like working at Redbubble and have you tried the print on demand side hustle yeah yeah I love Redbubble I think it's really great because it supports artists and it also helps people find their niche thing right find your thing on Redbubble working there was such a joy on many levels and I got to work with artists or creators in what they were doing I did do it a little bit on the side but to be honest I think I was just so deep in it that I didn't have the chance to make it a full side hustle although a lot of artists do or it supplements their work and I really love that idea about being able to create something once and then it can be sold as many times as possible. And that was the magic of Redbubble work, right? You can create a design once and it can be sold on a mug, on a t-shirt, on a bath mat, and you can sell it in an infinite amount of time. Obviously, there's parts around that where you have to think about how do you market yourself? How do you showcase yourself as an artist? And 
specifically knowing your niche audience. So are people actually looking for that design? Funny enough, I did sell a couple stickers, which I thought was awesome. I had designed a couple stickers and they got sold. And I was like, yes, feels amazing to have someone buy your work and you don't know who they are or how they found it. And you're like, yay, someone likes what I designed. Working there was a lot of fun and a lot of cool things. And I love that you use Redbubble as well as a passive income side hustle yeah it was good fun i might have to come up with some captain fire stickers like do you really need to buy this or this car is 20 years old bumper sticker but i think we're in a bit of a philosophical conundrum because of the whole not spending money thing and then spending money on stickers but you know what it comes down to your values and the interesting thing about the fire community is once you're drinking the kool-aid there's so many people drinking the kool-aid and in a way people want to communicate the tribe or the group or the organization or the belief system that they believe in so i could absolutely see people buying your sticker because it aligns with what their value is right if you're ready to level up your investing then studies show that automation and removing human error is going to be the key to your long-term success That's why I switched to automated investing through Perla using the Perla Auto Invest feature. Perla provides some of Australia's lowest brokerage costs and many ETFs are even brokerage free through them, which keeps more money in your pocket. Perla are chair sponsored through the ASX, which means your investments are securely held against your individual HIN and there is no doubt as to the safety and security of your investments. Perla have a host of tools and features to help you reach financial independence quicker and you can even follow me and see all of my investments through your Perla login. You can read all about Perla from my comprehensive review at www.captainfire.com forward slash Perla dash review and for an exclusive invite code and free trade, use sign up code CAPTAINFIRE. Look, I want to shift gears a little bit now and just ask you a couple of personal questions, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. Awesome. We talked a little bit about it when it comes to career, but just straight up, is there anything you wish you knew before you began your career? Probably don't do a BFA. No, (laughs) that's a lie. I loved studying art and critical thinking and communications, but I think I wish I knew that you can get into a different industry if you want to. I think it took me a very long time to feel as though I wasn't pigeonholed in an art sector and realize that I can move over to a different space. So for example, now I work in fintech. Uh, I work for a company called Perler and I really love working with them because they really align with my values. But had you asked me 10 years ago, if I'd be working in fintech as a product manager, I would have been like, no, that's like totally out of my capability or my skill set. And so I wish I just knew that I needed to believe in myself and go do the thing and you can do the thing. You can always upskill, you can always negotiate, you can always learn and you can work in tech without being an engineer yeah that's probably like one of the top things I wish I knew that's great just be confident for sure oh I guess the other thing I was going to say is that if you jump jobs quicker you'll probably increase your salary quicker as well so when I was chatting to a purple life I think she quadrupled her salary by changing companies starting out on 60 or something and then literally finishing in the mid to high 200s and then she pulled the pin pretty early on fire I think she fired with something like 500 600,000 and it's been really cool to actually watch her quarterly updates and her investments just keep growing yeah. uh, she just keeps generating money it's brilliant what's possible when you focus on how much you can actually create okay so another person Personal question. All right. And again, disclaimer, not financial advice. This is just what Anna does with her money. Anna, what are your personal investing preferences? So I personally invest in property and ETFs. I do have stock, which I won't mention, but I prefer to have something a bit broader. And I invest in myself. I think that's a huge part of also just career growth and growing is like investing in myself and being able to allow myself to do the side hustles on the side, right? Because some of my investing has been side hustles and investing in time and energy and doing Airbnbs and so forth. So I've done all of that. I'm just not doing it now. Now I'm just like solely career focused with the side of passive income of ETFs and property. Oh, I just got a shiver up my spine when you said to BNB. I had a bit (laughs) of a negative experience, unfortunately, trying to do an Airbnb side hustle with some friends in Sydney right before COVID hit. Um, and it was a bit of a hectic loss but anyway you miss 100% of the shots you don't take right and look (laughs) there are people that you know do it quite successfully but I do love that you talk about investing in 
yourself and personal development because there's so much that you can do investing in yourself. And you don't have to just go to uni and do a bachelor's degree or like an MBA or some kind of postgrad. There are vocational courses, things you can do across pretty much every industry that's going to help you to get better at what you're doing. Like at the moment, I'm doing courses on website design, SEO. I'm doing courses on how to become a better podcaster. And I'm still pretty crap, but we're getting better with each episode, right? So investing in yourself is really cool. Yeah, I like it. I think it's important. It's crucial in your own development as a person, right? Like we are so much happier when we have mastered something. And a part of that is actually just developing and growing. And that's what keeps us inspired as a human being. So you just have to do it. (laughs) Yeah. And again, I've actually really enjoyed stuff for personal development that hasn't necessarily been related to the income that I'm creating. So for me personally, like When I was a kid, I always wanted to be a test pilot and growing up watching things like Top Gun and the right stuff. And I just thought that those guys were really cool. And having gone through like engineering, I loved the idea of test and evaluation. And so I spent a lot of my uni and my bachelor's and post-grad master's in engineering doing things like T&E. And I might not be a test pilot, but it's just something that I found really interesting But some of the skills that I've learned on T&E have really helped me with my business. Like, for example, one of the mottos in test and evaluation is test often, fail early. And often pushing a product live or something live and getting the feedback, it's better than procrastinating. Like maybe it doesn't work if we're talking about a spaceship, right? You don't want to send it up half built. But when we're talking about things like websites and products and you work in this space, it's really useful design philosophy. So not all personal investments have to be directly related to your career, but you'll still find a lot of benefit from them. Okay, so almost finishing up off the top of your head, top three tips for someone on the path to financial independence. Top three tips. Yeah. Number one, I would say the shockingly simple math of early retirement by Mr. Money Mustache. Read that blog post. That would be number one. Number two kind of ties into just knowing your expenses and your net worth. So just tracking because you can't measure the things you don't track. So you have to track them so that you know that you're on the right path. And then number three would be reduce your expenses and increase your income. And that's probably the big ones. It's brilliant. The gap. Increase the gap. Increase the gap. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So finishing up, I'd love to just hear who or what has been some of the most biggest influences on your journey to financial independence. People, blogs, books, podcasts, that kind of thing. So I think it's hard to not mention Mr. Money Mustache, obviously. N- number one, great blog. Canadians are all sticking together. Right? There's some <laughs> ulterior nationalistic motive here. Yeah, absolutely. He's the original one. You have to give him a shout out. Millionaire Expat is a book that I read by Andrew Helm. And I thought he was really great. He also has another book called Millionaire Teacher. And uh, both these books were about like frugality and investing. The expat one I thought was really fantastic, especially if you're planning on geo arbitrage or living elsewhere, or you don't know where you're going to retire. It was really helpful in my journey. So I would say that. I got a lot of information from the Choose FI podcast because when I came across FIRE, there was very little FIRE in Canada and in Australia. And, and so Choose FI was a podcast that I just consumed on a regular basis. And then I think one of the first blogs I came across in Australia was the Aussie Firebug. And if you're not familiar with him in Australia, lots of great information on there as well. So those are probably the top ones on the top of my head. Yeah, those are all brilliant. I love it. And actually, there's one book in there that I don't think I've read. So I'm going to add that to my reading list and I'll add it to my list on the website as well. That's been brilliant. Look, Anna, it's been wonderful chatting to you. I feel like I've learned quite a bit about particularly career advancement and negotiation. Again, I wish I had done this interview 10 years ago. (laughs) It's sort of been brilliant. So look, Anna, where can listeners get in touch with you or read your blog and and learn more about you? Yeah, I'm under social or even my website, anachristina.com. So you can find me there. Awesome. And if any big fintechs are listening to this, Anna's starting wage is $1 million. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. All right. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today, Anna. Wish you all the best, especially with the family. It sounds like you've got your hands full there. So look forward to reading on some of the latest developments as they come out. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. No worries. See you, Anna. Bye.
Thanks for listening to another episode of the Captain Fi Financial Independence Podcast. To read the transcripts or check out the show notes, head over to www.captainfi.com for all the details. If you have a question for the captain, make sure to get in touch. You might even make it on the airwaves. You can reach me online through the Captain Fi contact form or get in touch through the socials. I'm active on Facebook and Instagram, as well as a number of online finance and investing forums. And finally, remember, the information presented on the show and the links provided are for general information purposes only. They should not be taken as constituting professional financial advice. You should always do your own research when making any financial decisions and make sure it's appropriate for your personal circumstance. 